this is Perch. And uh, while I was gone, um, we uh, I got a lot more mail. So uh, I'm further buried under this uh, this pile of mail, which I appreciate. I don't mean to say it that way. Like I, I upset by it. I love all the mail. I just uh, increasingly I wonder when I'm going to get to it all, or if that day is ever going to happen. Uh, the the channel itself, uh, it, you know. I'm on the cusp of being uh, at 30,000 subscribers, which is weird to me. I, I just, I never, I, I don't know. I remember having a conversation with my wife saying, uh, yeah, I'm going to do this and maybe there'll be a hundred subscribers period. And so the idea that there's all the, 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 there's all this stuff. I mean, the mail comes in generally, I'd say about 30 a day uh, of questions and things. And, um, I, I just, I don't know what to do with all that. I, <laughs> it's, it's fun. Because simultaneously, you know, I, as much as uh, he jokes around, you know, when you look at uh, Mumbles, who who trolls, uh, you know, on the in the comments, you know, a, a decent part of me agrees with Mumbles. Like this is rambling nonsense, and uh, a lot of people who do come into the comments like to, especially when I'm saying something that goes against a lot of the outrage channels. They're like, "Well, you just don't know what you're talking about," because. You're, you're not paying attention to the commies and blah, 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 blah. And, and so when I see stuff like that, my impression is always, you know, this is a very niche channel and it's, you know, it, it, who's paying attention to this? Uh, but then all these mails come in. So it's, it's hard to wrap my head around what's going on. Um, it just, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to navigate that. I don't know. But, uh, but let's get to some mail and let's get to some mail about, um, you know, ideas for, pricing, fixing things inside of comics. Here's here's a good one. It says, uh, hey, Perch, I think we both fall into the group of Batman fans who wish for less Batman titles and more anything else at DC. Absolutely, I fall into that group. I like Batman. What's weird is that when you complain about Batman, when you say things like, man, DC's putting out too much Batman, you get a lot of, well, why do you hate Batman? It's like, I, no, I don't hate Batman. I, I just think, you know, we don't need 30 Batman titles a month. You know, I... I uh, it's too much Batman. Like, give me, give me three really good Batman titles, and then do some other things. I don't know. I, I to me, it's almost self-preservation. The more you do about that, the more likely it is you're going to burn out Batman and get me to hate Batman by the fact that you're just doing too much of it. But anyway, sorry. The mail continues. Would it be prudent uh, of DC to look at months where they have no new Batman titles and say, "What the hell? We're not advertising a single Bat book." for this month that ad space is for anything else. What's even the point of advertising existing bat books? Yeah, that's an interesting comment. So let's, let's think about that for a second. Um, first off, do we think that DC's advertising is doing anything positive at all? Me meaning, is it having any kind of, of net increase of sales effect? Um, my theory is no. My suspicion is that, uh, you know, DC puts out, ads for their books, I don't think it's really leading to any more or less sales of the books they're promoting. So when DC promotes up, uh, you know, some dark night, uh, you know, oh, look, Chip Zdarsky's, well, he's coming onto the title. It's a bad example. Look, Jock is doing this Batman book and they put a bunch of advertising behind it. Did it, did that alter or change the orders or the purchases whatsoever for that book? I, I tend to doubt it. Uh, because Batman is so present in the company, I'm not sure any of this advertising is actually doing anything. I think it's they're just dumping money into, you know, I, I'd love to see the KPIs on that, if any of it is doing anything. I mean, look, you've got, you know, a new Sean Murphy book coming out. You have the, the Beyond the White Knight book coming out. And it's having to share advertising with two other, you know, the Tom King doing a little Batman miniseries and a Batman Beyond, a different Batman Beyond miniseries. Like, you got... And is any of the advertising clarifying who should buy what? Or are people coming in going, I like Tom King or I like Sean Murphy. I'm going to buy that book. That, that's all. That's I don't think any of this is helping. So, yes, I do think the money should be funneled somewhere else. But overall, I think the advertising, the marketing needs to be looked at and say, just, what are we doing? Is any of it working? Is any of this bringing in new customers? I tend to doubt it. Anyway, the mail continues. Also on a related note, do you think the concept of loss leader could apply to help comics today? Thinking back on the Batman Tencent adventure, if I were DC or Marvel, I'd have at least one title out there in a serialized format, cheap paper, revolving door of aspiring creators with new stories, and a 99 or 199 cover price 
just to try to bring back some readers or bring in some new readers who go in, pick up the cheap book and think, I didn't uh, come in here for just $2. I guess I'll buy something else since I'm here. I think absolutely it's a good idea. Uh, and put it Again, you, you go to the mass. When you're putting out 80 books, you can afford to have a couple books out there that are cheaper. Unfortunately, the way the companies are probably thinking about this is print is a is 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 over. I mean, it's 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 gone. If they're going to do those kinds of efforts, they're going to do it digitally. And maybe, but but unfortunately, digital is not a great loss leader if you're talking about growing a bigger business because, as we've talked about in other videos, there's not a good profile or system to go from digital to print. So what I mean by that is, let's say uh, DC uh, announces, hey, we're going to partner up with Facebook or Meta uh, or Twitter or whatever, and we're going to put out a serialized comic. So once a month, um, why do I, you, why, you might be going, why, what's the social media aspect of it? Well, Japan did this very successfully with Line. So Shueisha partnered with Line and they did uh, you know, some free content on that platform to help generate interest. It was a very, very successful effort. Um, you know, beyond all means, why it was so successful is because it was free. It was easy to consume and it, it got people to see it even if they didn't want to, because what would happen was somebody would, uh, would, you know, find this thing, would share it. And whether you're interested in comics or not, it's being shared to you. So suddenly now it's popping up on your, you know, on your feed in your dashboard and you are, you're being exposed to comics, you know, via somebody else in, in, in real life, that'd be the equivalent of like, you know, you're in a store and somebody comes up to you and puts a comic book in your face. That's that it, it was great. It worked very, very well. Uh, the, the challenge though, is that unlike Japan, so in Japan, when people saw that they could very quickly go over and start to read the, uh, you know, look at the Shueisha app and a lot of their business model had already profiled to digital print hybrid. So there was, there's already a, a, a path for people who are getting that comic for the first time to easily step in. And I think with the line experiment, what happened is on the last panel, it was clickable. And when you click that, it took you right to the purchase to then read the next chapter and kind of get involved in the ecosystem. If they tried the same thing here, it's a broken system. So if DC or, or Marvel put something out on Facebook or on Twitter at, you know, free or, you know, or basically free, it would have to be. And then at the end, you clicked on it. Where would you go? You'd go to Marvel Unlimited where they're going to try and sign you up for $10 a month. But it, it, it's just not the same. It, it's not the same business model. It, it would You'd lose people. You'd get what they call tech dropouts at that point where people just wouldn't follow the path to that next step. And because your core comic audience today has not embraced digital and they're still on print, there's not even an easy way to, to do that. So it, it's a broken system. So now we're back to, okay, you got to print a comic and you got to print a comic, put it out for a dollar and have that be kind of your, um, you know, your, your entry point. And the, I think, I think you could still do that, but I think along with the cheaper price, you've got to figure out a place to put it. So this is where you are going to have to sign some kind of agreement with a grocery store or with a target or a Walmart, whatever it happens to be to have this comic there. Now here's the crazy part. Let's, uh, let's, let, let's play out this scenario. Marvel Comics, it's owned by Disney, and I talked in another video about the Disney pop-up stores and other things they're doing at Target. Uh, Disney comes to them, Marvel and Disney comes to Target, and basically says, hey, we want to put two comic books in your store, and we need you to give us shelf space. They're going to be traditional, the comic book sizing, everything else. Where, you know, I know Target's playing into nostalgia type stuff, so we want you to put it, but it needs to be in a good place. It can't be stuffed in a weird zone where nobody can find it. So we want it up by the registers. Or, failing that, we want it in the Disney store in your little toy section that you've set up. And maybe failing that needs to be with the video games. It needs to be in a place that kind of more or less makes sense. It can't be crammed in somewhere. And what we're going to do is we're going to supply you this comic. It's going to be a dollar, so it's going to be super cheap. We at Marvel are going to make, you know, basically nothing off this. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be cash poor for us. It's going to be a loss leader. Um, U.S. Target will have some a content that's a little different to sell, so you're also not going to make money off of it. But Target and Walmart, places like that, 
they do do these experiments. They do take products that they make very little margin on because it helps capture the overall, you know, retail market. They're able to say, come in here and, you know, you, you pick up a comic book, you pick up a magazine, um, make target your one stop shop. So what, the, you know, the value is to say, look, we're going to maybe do one Marvel comic, one star Wars comic. We're going to supply it to you. That's going to give kids another reason to come in. It's going to be monthly or maybe better yet. It's every two weeks. We're going to put a new one in here. And then the other part of the deal is Marvel would have to actually generate, you know, you know, put good artists on this thing. They would actually have to have, you know, it can't be cheaply done. It has to actually have legit, you know, big name people on it. So it's a, it's a viable product. And then in the comic book, Marvel needs to say, you know, here's your options from here. You can go download the Marvel Unlimited app. You can go to your local comic shop and get more comics. You know, it's a couple different places for you. Um, so Marvel would take that at a loss or a, at least profit zero proposition. Uh, Target Walmart would have to take it at a, you know, very thin margin proposition, which again, they do that today for several things. And I think they do it in fact, another way you could say it is uh, by being part of our Disney store pop-up inside the inside your shop, um, you have to take this book. This is part of that overall agreement. They could do it that way. Um, again, plenty of plenty of times they've done this in the past, so it is it is de definitely possible. I think that would be probably the most powerful thing they could do in terms of promoting stuff and getting that cheaper price out there. It it would work. It's smart business. It would help them uh, overall, and I, it's just it would be it'd be the right thing for them to do at this particular stage of the business. Um, and and frankly, you're not losing much. You you call it a loss leader, but right now, and I've been I've been uh, don't ask me why, but I've been looking at at rates for creators for comic artists uh, to do covers and interior, and I've been getting some rates down. And there are big name artists whose cover rate is $450, $600. You'd be shocked. Uh, one of the biggest cover artists is willing to do covers for me for $1,000 a cover. That is nothing, nothing. So if you, if you just play this out to produce a comic book, you're talking about a sub, you know, somewhere between $50,000, $60,000 investment to just get the labor all put together. That is absolutely, uh, for these giant companies, easy to do. So they should do it. Anyway, good question. Uh, love talking about the business aspect of it. Um, yeah, please, please, you know, do something other than bat books. Don't cancel all the bat books. Just, just do some other things. Get a big company. Lots of IP. And thanks for listening.